All right, so yesterday we got our crash course in functional groups and then we finished talking about resonance a little bit. How many of you are confused with resonance? You can be honest, it's confusing. Most people are confused with this. The main idea with resonance is that Lewis structures, like we said, don't correctly describe molecules because we said if the Lewis structures were correct as drawn, we would expect one of those CO double bonds to be longer than the other, right? Because we know that double bonds are shorter than single bonds. The truth is, when we look at this experimentally, those bonds are the same length, so we had to come up with a theory to describe why they're the same length. And that's where resonance comes into play. And so I gave an example down here where we said all of the carbons must be sp2 hybridized according to the work that we were previously doing, which means there must be a p orbital off of each of those carbons. And we know that the p orbitals must be in complete alignment with one another. So they're all pointed up in the same direction. In this case, the pi bond, because it's right next door to that vacant p orbital on the far right hand side, can actually migrate or delocalize across all three of those p orbitals, meaning it doesn't belong to any two particular carbons. The two electrons that make up that pi bond are actually shared between all three carbons. It's kind of a blob of electron density. So we show this using um, resonance structures. It's a little bit weird to think about. Students oftentimes get really hung up on this. And they say, are these flipping back and forth really fast in space? Not really. The average of these two is actually the more um, accurate descriptor, right? So the pi bond isn't localized, the bonds are actually in between single and double bonds all the way through this system. So it's actually a bond and a half, bond order of 1.5. And then down here we said the same often happens with negative charges, where we said experimentally the carbon on the far right we would think would be sp3 but is actually sp2, but that again makes sense because if it's sp2, the lone pair would be in that p orbital, and same idea, if it's in a p orbital, it can kind of align with the pi bond, and then that negative charge can delocalize across the entire system. So it does get a little bit weird to think about, right? All right, so what I'm going to do next is talk about how to draw these resonance structures a little bit more clearly. This was just our general overview. And I'll give you some pretty specific rules. All right, rule number one when drawing resonance structures is never break sigma bonds. We can only move pi bonds and lone pairs. The way I think of sigma bonds is they're the backbone of your molecule, right? If we rip them apart, we're actually ripping your molecule apart. Pi bonds, on the other hand, they can migrate or delocalize across a molecule, no problem. Same thing with lone pairs. All right, number two is never exceed an octet. What do we call that if we have a carbon with more than an octet? Texas carbon, and I'll give you a frowny face, so let's avoid doing that. All right, number three is use arrows to show movements of electrons. Don't use arrows to move positive charge. So I'll kind of show you what that means later. Anytime we show arrows as electron pushing arrows in chemistry, we're showing movement of electrons, showing where they go to. Positive charges don't go anywhere, right? They just get filled in the process. So we want to make sure that we show it that way. All right, so I'll show you the arrow system we use, and this is true for 
reaction mechanisms, and resonance arrows. Looks like this, where at the beginning we've got our electron source. What electrons can we move? Lone pairs or pi bonds. And then electron destination. So the arrowhead is always showing where the electrons are being delivered to. Um, the electron destination can be an atom or a bond next door. Meaning we can't move electrons all the way across to the other side of the molecule. We want to show it moving one step at a time to its next door neighbor. All right, I've got some funny examples for everybody, but I like this one first. All right, the first example is a conceptual one. All right, let's say we have a resonance structure that consists of a blue horse on one side and a red donkey. Like I said previously, to show resonance structures, we need brackets on the exterior sides, and we need double-headed arrows in the middle. Does that mean, in this case, that we have something that is rapidly switching between a red donkey and a blue horse? What's the more accurate descriptor of what's going on in this situation? Purple mule. Purple mule. <laughs> exactly. Someone gets it. So that's exactly what's going on with resonance structures. It's not that it's flip-flopping, it's that it's kind of an average of the two, not necessarily an equal weighted average, but it's gonna be a hybrid of the two. All right, so let's see some practice ones. All right, so for this practice, I'm gonna be good about drawing all my brackets. I'm gonna say, all right, I've got this compound, might look a little bit familiar. Can I go ahead and move this charge somewhere? Why not? We can't move our positive charge, right? We can only move pi bonds and lone pairs, all right? What we could do though, is I could say what happens, in fact, let's draw in all of our hydrogens just so we can keep track of everything. What happens is maybe we can move this pi bond down here. Whoops, let me highlight it. Where could we move it to? Just next door, right? So in this case, I'm going to move it to the bond that is right next door. I'll show a double-headed arrow to indicate that this is resonance, not a reaction. And then we'll check all of our rules at the end. All right, have we exceeded an octet anywhere? Nope, I don't think so. Uh, did we break any sigma bonds? Nope, we broke a pi bond, that's allowable. Um, we used arrows to only show movements of pi bonds or lone pairs. Yeah, that's all checking out. All right, what else am I missing though? My positive charge, where should it be? On the left carbon, right? All right, so if we think about the hybrid, we would say, all right, we've got all of these hydrogens. None of those sigma bonds moved, so those hydrogens are gonna stay put. The pi bond isn't localized, meaning this isn't a true alkene. Instead, that pi bond is essentially going to be shared across all three of those atoms. And the positive charge is going to be shared between the leftmost and rightmost carbon. I like to call this my hybrid view. Does that make sense? All right, let's do the other one that we practiced yesterday. Yeah. 
So the dots represent a lone pair, right? So we have two extra electrons on the right-hand side. Are you talking about these dots? Oh, sorry, up here. You're talking about these. That basically says it's not a true double bond. It's kind of in between. So we don't want to draw it as a solid line. Yeah. So instead, it's two electrons being shared across that entire region. That's a really good question. All right. This is the other one we looked at yesterday. This one gets a bit harder. All right. We can't move sigma bonds. We can move lone pairs, or we can move pi bonds. We've got some decisions to make. So let's try some practice ones, and we might make mistakes, but that's OK. So in this first one, let's try to mimic what we did above, and we'll see if this works. Is this okay? What's wrong? Yeah, so you said over on the right hand side, right here, we've exceeded an octet. That is not allowed. So we can't do this as a valid arrow pushing move. Okay? So I'll just go ahead and erase it. If you want, you can cross it out on your page and say that won't work. All right? So we can't move that pi bond. What's our other option? Okay, move the lone pair. All right, so to show that, I'll just have an arrow coming from the lone pair, and we can show it moving to the adjacent bond. What's an issue we might run into, though? Same thing. So don't copy this down. I'm just showing this as an example. The problem we'd run into if we did that and didn't do anything else is the central position would have more than an octet. But this is a fixable problem, right? Because we can continue moving lone pairs or pi bonds, right? So what I might do to avoid this octet problem is at the same time that the lone pair is pushed down, I would move that pi bond all the way over to the other carbon atom. I think that might work. All right, so if I do that, I've avoided the problem of having an octet on, or more than an octet on any given atom. But you notice how in the first example on the very top, I only needed to use one arrow. On the bottom example, I had to use two. There will be situations where you may need to use more than one arrow. That's perfectly acceptable. In general, if you have a positive charge on your molecule, you'll need to use only one arrow at a time. If you have a negative charge, oftentimes you'll need to use more than one arrow to show the movement without violating an octet rule anywhere. All right, hybrid view. All of the hydrogens are staying put. We didn't move any of those sigma bonds. If we look at the pi bond, we have a pi bond showing them the left resonance structure. Is it really a true double bond? No, it's exactly like up above. Where in this case, we're going to move that pi bond around all three of those orbitals. Yep. Yes, so in... I'm not sure. So are you saying why don't we show it like that? Yeah. So we said if we do it that way, we would exceed an octet, which isn't allowed. So sometimes we have to do this guessing and checking at first. Um, if we do it that way, we would run into that dead end of exceeding an octet, and there'd be no way to fix it, right? So you're talking about over here? Yeah, so we could do that. Let's actually draw that underneath. I think that's a great one. So let's ignore the red arrows. In fact, we'll talk about this more in a bit. So we would still have a lone pair right here. We would have another lone pair right there, right? That was that pi bond set of electrons. 
All right, what else would I be missing? I think I'm missing one important thing. What charge would this carbon atom have? Positive. It would be positive, right? Technically, you could draw this as a resonance structure and you wouldn't be breaking any rules. However, this looks incredibly unstable. We've increased the number of charges. Ideally, we want to avoid drawing resonance structures where we have both carbon positive and carbon minus in the same molecule. I'll talk about that a little later though. But you could draw this, it's just such a tiny, 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 tiny contributor, it's not even worth drawing out. Yep? Oh, sorry, that should just be a regular equal. Sometimes you see... I don't know, maybe I'm... No, it's fine. Um, sometimes I do that as like equivalent to... Oh, yeah. That's a good question. I sometimes just get carried away. <laughs> Seriously, if if you have a question, I guarantee you 10 other people in the room have the same question, so please raise your hand. Otherwise, I'll just keep on going. All right, we're not done with our hybrid view, though, over on the right-hand side. What am I missing? The charge, right? So is the negative charge on one particular atom? No, it's shared. So in this case, it would be partial negative here, partial negative here. So these two resonance structures are really similar. The only difference is in one, the positive charge is delocalized, and the other, the negative charge is. All right, let's try a more challenging one. All right, everybody remembers this polyatomic ion, right? Oops, I'm forgetting a negative charge over here. What's this polyatomic ion called? Nitrate. So it's one of the common polyatomic ions you probably learned about in Gen Chem. This also has resonance. We need to figure out what the heck is going on in the resonance structure. All right, so just like before, we said that we can move lone pairs and pi bonds, but not positive charges, right? So let's pick. I'm just going to pick a lone pair down here. I'm going to say, okay, I want to move one of these lone pairs, right? If I move that right here, I would form a new pi bond, but then that nitrogen would have five bonds off of it, right? Is there any way to fix that, though? Move the double bond, right? We can move pi bonds. So maybe I'll move it up to that oxygen, right? All right, my question for you is why can't I move this pi bond down there to where the oxygen nitrogen bond is? Yeah, then the nitrogen, nitri or sorry, the oxygen would have more than an octet. So that's not allowed. But we can move the pi bond up to the oxygen. All right, so we're getting there. Let me clean this up. We've got a double bond here, single bond to that oxygen, single bond to that oxygen. The two oxygens with single bonds must have a negative charge according to their formal charges, right? All right, so we've done one step. What else could we do next? We could do it again, right? So again, we get to kind of choose, but I'll show you a problem. What if I take this lone pair and I do this? Same issue, right? We need to break a pi bond. I'd have to go like that. What would happen if we did that? We would go back to our original drawing, right? So you could get stuck in these loops where you're just going back and redrawing the same molecule. You're not really drawing a new structure in that process though, right? So maybe that's a dead end we want to avoid just because we've already drawn that. All right, let me clean this up. So we know dead end there. What else could we do? Well, maybe grab a lone pair off the other oxygen atom. Okay, so in this one, maybe I'll take a lone pair, drop it down there, and kick a pi bond over here. Clean 
clean this up. All right, my question for you is, are all three of these structures different? Yeah, I think the answer is kind of yes and no, right? So if we look at them as just a static, non-movable object, in the first one, the double bond is pointed up. In the second one, the double bond is pointed down and to the left. And on the third one, the double bond is pointed down and to the right. So in that way, they're all different, right? That's common with resonance structures. We may draw structures that look really similar, but the location of the double bond changes. We're going to assume that the molecule is static and not moving, meaning not spinning around in space, not flipping over, nothing like that going on. Does that make sense? All right, so now let's think about the hybrid view of nitrate. We know that we have a central nitrogen atom. We know that we've got sigma bonds to all of the oxygen atoms. We know all of the oxygen atoms at the very minimum have two lone pairs on them, two sets of lone pairs. All right, where should we show the double bond? Everywhere, <laughs> exactly. So the top one is double bond, at least in one of them. And the second one, the double bond is down here, so I'd show that as a dash, but it's not double bonded in all of them. And then last but not least, we could show a double bond right there. All right, not quite done yet. Where are the negative charges? Shared between all of the oxygens, right? So we'd say delta negative here because that oxygen two thirds of the time carries a charge. In fact, you could even label this as negative two thirds if you want. Delta negative and delta negative. And then last but not least, we know that the nitrogen has a positive charge. The positive charge in this case is stuck permanently on that nitrogen though. It's kind of interesting to think about. So which is the longest nitrogen oxygen bond? They're all the same length, which experimentally is exactly what we see. So it is a little bit confusing. Yep. Yeah, so if you wanted to, instead of drawing it like that, we know that you see how two out of the three resonance structures, this would be negative two thirds. So negative two divided by three. And then over here, you could write negative two thirds. Honestly, I prefer that students just do the partial ones. Because in this case, the charge is shared equally across all of the oxygen atoms, but that's not always the case. And I don't want students to assume that that's always the case. So it's OK to just draw uh, the delta symbols. All right, let's try another one. What happens if we have a molecule with no charge? So I'll go ahead and draw out every single atom. Sometimes I find it helpful to draw out all of the bonds and all of the atoms instead of bond line notation while we're first learning. All right. So we've got some decisions to make. In this case, we don't have a negative charge. We don't have a positive charge. What can we move? Lone pair or the pi bond. All right, I personally really like moving lone pairs first. So let's try that. So we've got this lone pair on this nitrogen. All right, so I'm gonna move this lone pair all the way down there. Form a double bond between that nitrogen and carbon. But we would run into a problem. What next? Yeah, we would have to move this pi bond. And where would we move the pi bond to? Yep. To the right. So we go right next to that carbon, or on that carbon, I should say. All right, 
Does that kind of make sense so far? We avoided drawing an octet by breaking that pi bond. I think that's perfectly valid. All right, my next question for you that I want to check with your partner about is about the nitrogen. Do you think the nitrogen is sp, sp2, or sp3? So check with your neighbor and see if you agree. Let's come back together again, because honestly, this is very confusing. All right, if I look at this nitrogen over here, I would say, well, it's got a lone pair. It's got three bonded atoms. Shouldn't this be trigonal pyramidal? What hybridization do trigonal pyramidal atoms have? SP3. SP3, okay. However, when I look over here, things change a little bit, right? If I look at that nitrogen, it has three bonded atoms and no lone pairs. What's the geometry for that? Trigonal planar, what would the hybridization be? SP2. SP2. Ah, we have a problem, right? Mm -hmm. So then the question is, will it be SP2 or SP3? It's an interesting question. Let me think about it this way. All right, in order to form this pi bond right here, we must have a p orbital, right? What does that tell us about nitrogen's hybridization? It must be sp2, right? So it's interesting. Let's make a note of that. It must be sp2 in order for delocalization to occur. So delocalization basically means that the electrons don't belong to a specific atom. They're kind of shared across multiple atoms. So delocalization and resonance are two terms that are often used interchangeably. So I'll say these electrons delocalize in this resonance structure. Yeah, good question. Oh, okay, that's fine. I'll, I'll try to do my best, but we want to try to use the best terminology whenever um, we're writing stuff down. All right, so a little bit weird for that one, right? It's kind of the curveball we have to be aware of. If we have resonance, we need to always consider the other resonance structures as well when determining hybridization. Yep? Wouldn't the molecule form on the left be much more stable than the one on the right because there's no charges on it? That's a really good uh, point. So you were saying that the molecule on the right would be a lot less stable than the one on the left because the one on the right has charges, the one on the left doesn't. You're entirely correct. However, just because you have a hybrid structure that's going to be a smaller contributor to the overall picture doesn't mean that it doesn't exist and we still need to account for it. That's great though. In fact, that's what we're going to start out tomorrow talking about is major and minor contributors to resonance structures. All right, let's do another one. This one I'm going to do bond line formula. All right, for this one, we need to draw resonance structures. All right, but we're doing bond line formula this time. We're not doing resonance or uh, full individual atoms. Whoops, I'm forgetting my hydrogen too. Breaking my own rule. All right, so my question for you is can we move this pi bond or that lone pair, excuse me? Let's think about it. Can I move this lone pair right there? Why or why not? Mm -hmm. 
But let's think about it, right? Even though I didn't draw these, we have two assumed hydrogens right there. What would happen if we formed a pi bond between the nitrogen and that carbon? We would have a Texas carbon, and I would be really upset, right? Yep. That's supposed to be a hexagon with a nitrogen at one point. Yeah, so sorry. <laughs> Let's try and right here, 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 and here are all carbon atoms, right? All right, so that won't work. We would violate an octet rule. So not allowed. That's okay. We've learned. Okay, so let's go ahead and unhighlight these. What else might we want to consider moving? Double bond. All right, my question for you. Can I move the double bond right there? Nope, we'd run into the exact same problem of octet. It's uh, an octet being violated for that carbon. All right, where should we move it? The oxygen. Okay. Oops, forgot my nitrogen. Am I forgetting anything? The charge on the carbon. Exactly. This carbon underneath here must have a positive charge. All right? So if we look at this one, things get a little bit interesting. What do you think the hybridization is for the nitrogen? So talk with your neighbor and see if you can decide. So let's kind of check in. How many of you think it's going to be sp3? How many of you think it'll be sp2? All right, so it looks like most people think sp3. Why wouldn't it be sp2 in this situation, even though it was in the situation right above it? Can we delocalize and form a pi bond to it? No. So in this case, the lone pair on nitrogen doesn't ever have the opportunity to move anywhere else in that molecule. It is forever stuck on that nitrogen, right? Because of that, it's going to be sp3. So always be aware, we have to check for resonance before we can assign hybridization. Sometimes it's sneaky and it will actually be a different hybridization than what it first appears. Other times it'll be exactly what it appears to be. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It depends. So the question was, whenever we break a pi bond, will one of the atoms always be positive? Yeah, like the, the so, so down here, that became positive? Yeah. Yes, for the most part. However, we'll see situations where you can show a bunch of electron pushing arrows. But for right now, we'll just do baby steps. And in that case, if you break a pi bond, normally it will go from neutral to positive or, and negative on either side. Good questions. Any other questions? All right, I will plead and implore you to please do as many book problems as possible. Um, number one complaint I hear in this class is on the first exam, they're like, everything made sense in lecture. And then on the exam, 
I had no idea what you were showing me. Um, oftentimes, concepts like this look a lot easier when we work through them together as a group. Um, however, the challenge comes when you're alone. Um, so make sure that you practice it, practice it, practice it, practice it. And then what do you do if you have a question? Ask me, ask a friend, ask the Writing and Tutoring Center. This is a big team activity, so we want to make sure we don't leave anyone behind. So, yeah.